for some tobacco. I don't know where Joe is. I don't know how you can stand that fur on you, Clara, a night like this. Rather cool out. Are you out there, Joe? He's not out there. Well, he must be around here someplace. He was not here about two minutes ago when I went upstairs. Are you down there, Joey? Yes. All right. What do you want? Well, I don't want anything. I was just wondering where you were. That cellar fooling with that old radio thing. He says he can make one himself, but I says I'll believe it when I see it. There's some of that candy you like. Oh, did you bring me some of that nice candy? Oh, isn't that lovely? Look, Clara, don't that look nice? Yes, they do their candy up nice. I like the pink ones. Mmm, that is nice candy, doesn't it? Yes, I like bonbons. <laughs> I do too. I think I like bonbons more than anything. Sorry, these are not all bonbons. They are all bonbons. There's oh. nothing else in there. Are they? I thought only the pink ones were the bonbons. No, so they're all bonbons. Well, that's lovely. <laughs> Is it you're not home tonight, Clara? Frank had some kind of dinner at the Glenwood Club, so I thought I'd stay in town and get something. He said he'd call in for me here around 8 o'clock. Men are always having dinner somewhere. <laughs> it seems to me they can't talk about anything unless they have a dinner in front of them. Where's, uh, where's Amy? Upstairs? Yeah, she's getting dressed. I was just cooking her when you came in. Is she going out? I don't know whether she is or not. I didn't hear her say, but it's Wednesday night, you know. Is that fellow still coming here? Oh, right on the dot, such as he is. And Sunday nights, too, now, as well as Wednesdays. It looks like a steady thing. And you never in your life heard anybody talk so much, Clara. I don't know how she stands him. Well, your pop can hardly stay in the same room where he is. I believe in my heart that's why he went over to Gillespie's tonight, so he wouldn't be listening to him. Doesn't she take him into the parlor? Well, she does, yes, but she might as well, he might as well stay in here for, he's not in there for five minutes before he's out here again talking about socialism. <laughs> that's all you hear, socialism and capital and labor. You think he knew something about it? And the Pennsylvania Railroad. Well, that's where he works, you know. I don't know what he does down there, but he says himself he's the head of the freight department. I says to our Joe, I says, I don't see how he could be the head of anything from the talk of him. <laughs> Joe says he thinks he's a nut. And your father said to his face last Sunday night that he don't know the meaning of the word socialism. Better not talk so loud or he's apt to walk in on us. Oh, he is a great joker, you know, Clara. That's what he did last Sunday night. Well, your pop and me was sitting here talking just the way we are right now. All of a sudden, I glanced up and there he was in the doorway doing this. Just like a bandit, you know. <laughs> well, I've got the breath and leave my body. And then he says, ha, ha, that's the time I fooled you. Well, I don't know how long he'd been standing there, but as luck would have it, we weren't talking about him then. Although we were five minutes before that. I don't know whether he heard us or not. I hope he did, for it would be just the price of him for being so smart. And you know what, Clara? You can't say a word about him in front of her. Oh, not a word. No matter what he says, she thinks it's lovely. When Joe told her that he thought he was a nut, she just laughed and said that Joe was jealous of him because he could express himself, and he couldn't. <laughs> he never heard such talk. 
You know, Clara? I think he wears a wig. <laughs> I do, honestly. And our Joe says he thinks he does too. But when I asked her about it the other morning, I thought she'd take the head right off me. And she says, it's a lie. She says, we don't wear a wig, she says. She says, people are always saying something that, like that about a fellow that makes a good appearance. But you know, he sits over here under this light. And I'm going to take a good look the very first chance I get. I can tell a wig as good as anybody. She won't make a liar out of me. Mama, did you see anything about that blue bar pin of mine? Which blue bar pin? Well, now, how many blue bar pins have I got? I don't know, and I don't care. So don't be bothering me about it. Well, if you can't find it, go look for it. She says, all she has to do is come to the head of them stairs and holler, and everybody will jump. But she'll get sadly left. I've got something else to do besides waiting on her. You know, Claire, I think she's meeting this fellow at lunchtime. Because in the mornings here, she stands fixing herself in front of that glass till it's no wonder to me she don't drop on the floor. Well, I said to her one morning when she was settling herself there till I got tired of looking at her, I said, you must be going to see him today, ain't ya? And she says, he must be on your mind, isn't he? And I says, no, but by the looks of things, he must be on yours. And I says, maybe after you get him, you won't think he was worth all the bother you went to. Because you know, Clara, she don't know a thing about him. Oh, not a thing, except that he works at the Pennsylvania Freight Office. He did tell her that much, but she don't know whether he works there or not. Well, he could tell her anything, and she'd believe him before she'd believe me. That's where he works, the Pennsylvania Freight Office. Well, how do you know? Frank knows him. Frank Highland? Yes. He says he eats his lunch at the same place. They're at 15th and Arch. And does he say he knows him? Yes. He said that he's seen him around him for a long time, and I often heard him talk about him, but I didn't know it was the same fellow. Frank always called him Carnation Charlie. He says he's always got a big carnation in his buttonhole. That's the one. He's always got it on when he comes here, too. Frank says he's never seen him without it. I haven't either. And I believe in my heart, Clara, that that is what turned her head. You often <laughs> see things like that, you know. The worst fool of a man can put a flower in his pocket and a hat over one eye and half a dozen sensible women will be dying about him. <laughs> well, Frank says this fellow's absolutely crazy. Well, he don't know who Frank Highland is, does he? No, Frank didn't tell him. He said he simply got talking to him and he mentioned that he was calling on a girl up this way named Fisher. So Frank asked him what his right name was and when he got home, he asked me about him. Well, is he sure it's the same fella? He said his name was Piper. That's the name, <laughs> Aubrey Piper. I don't know where the Aubrey came from. I never heard of such a name before, did you? Yes, I've heard the name of Aubrey. Well, I never did. <laughs> Sounds to me more like a place than a name. <laughs> Here she comes. <laughs> Be no use. Mom, you must have seen something about blue bar pin of mine. I can't find it anywhere. Well, I saw a pin of yours in one of them drawers a few days ago. I don't know whether it's there yet or not. How say you're not home tonight, Claire? I have my dinner in town. Is that part all right, Mom? Certainly it's all right. Well, did you sign it? Certainly I signed it. All right, Mom, don't make a fuss about it. No, but you'd think by the way she said it that I sat here all day with my two hands as long as each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you find it? Yes. <sighs> so I wonder you wouldn't leave them drawers the way you found them. She does this every time she goes near the bay. She's in such a rush lately. I'd like to see the kind of house that you'll keep. Oh, it won't be anything like this one, I'll tell you that. Oh, go easy, lady. You might be very glad to have it half so good. Where'd you put those flowers I brought home, Mom? 
Well, they're out there in the kitchen. I put them in some water. Well, I think it's time that you lit that light in that parlor, Amy, if that fellow of yours is coming. What time is it by your watch there, Clara? Quarter past eight. Oh, I must tell her. Oh my God, there goes the candy. Pick it up, Clara. I can't stoop and, and put it out of sight. Oh, it's no wonder I didn't do it when she was in here. Amy! What? Claire says it's quarter past eight by your watch. You better put some kind of light on in that parlor if that bell of yours is coming. She brings flowers home with her from the city. Every night he's coming. She must have flowers in the parlor. I told her, I said, I bet it'd be a long time before you bring any flowers home from the city to me. That's another new dress on her tonight, isn't it? Oh, she's had it about a week. What's she getting so many new dresses for lately? Having those? I don't. That's the fourth I've seen on her since Easter. Trying to make him think she's rich, I guess. I told her, I says, you might not get so many after you get him. <laughs> Amy, be careful of them lace curtains if you're going to light that lamp in there. I think I'll go before he comes. Oh, you better unless you want to be here all night. For once he starts talking, you'll never get out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> He's not here yet. You'd know if he was. She stands out there in the vestibule until she sees him get off the trolley. Then she comes in and lets him ring. So he won't think that she's waiting for him. You've never seen anyone so crazy about a fella. Well, I think somebody ought to tell her about her mom. Well, what's the good of telling her? And she'd only give you a look if it was anything about him. Well, I'd say something, whether she'd give me a look or not. But remember what I'm telling you, Mom. It's you that'll have them on your hands if she takes them. I'll have them on my hands. Well, now who else will, Mom? You couldn't let Amy go out on the street, and that's exactly where she'll land if she takes him. For you know how well Amy could get along on $150 a month. It takes more than that to keep herself, never name a house and a husband. And that's all he gets, Mom, for he's only a clerk down there. Well, he told her he's a head of the department. He's a clerk, Mom, like a hundred others down there. Frank knows what he does. Well, why don't you say something to her, Clara? Well, you know how much attention she'd pay to anything I'd say. Oh, she won't pay any attention to what anybody says. Especially if she knew it was Frank Highland that said it. She thinks everyone's jealous of him and jealous of her for getting him. So let her get him. She makes her bed, let her lie in it. That's the trouble, Mom. It's not always the one that makes the bed that lies in it. Well, it won't be anybody around here, I can promise you that. <laughs> But you know what you are, Mom, where Amy's concerned. <coughs> oh, don't be silly, Clara. Do you think your father would be listening to that rattle brain here every night? He'd have to, wouldn't he? Or go out as he did tonight. Maybe this is Frank now. <coughs> oh, hello, Frank. Hello, oh, Mother. Hello, oh, Clara. I was just going. I thought maybe you weren't coming. Oh, I couldn't get out there until nearly 8 o'clock. Frank, Clara says you know this fellow that comes to see our Amy. Who, Piper? Yes, the one that does so much talking. Yes, I know him. Frank, I think he's crazy. <clears throat> well, I do, honestly, and our cop and Joe says he thinks so, too. Mom said he told Amy he was head of the department, Frank. He did, Frank, and she believes him. But Claire says you say he's only a clerk down there. That's all he is, Mom. He isn't a head of the department, Frank. Frank? I beg your pardon. What did you say there? I say he uh, isn't a head of the department down there, is he, Frank? No, he's just one of the clerks. <laughs> oh. Well, now you see that? And she'd only laugh at you if you told her that. Well, how much do them great clerks get a month, Frank? 
Frank, Mom is talking to you. Oh, I beg your pardon. What did you say, Mother? I say, how much do them Frank clerks get a month down there? About a hundred and forty or fifty dollars. I I don't know exactly, but not, not any more than that. Well, what are we going to do about it, Frank? It looks like a steady thing. He comes Wednesdays and Sunday nights, too. And if she ever takes him, she'll be the poorest woman in the city. Well, you know how our Amy likes to spend money. Well, she's got seven pairs of shoes up in that hall closet. Amy certainly does let her money fly. Well, if she does, she earns it. She might as well have a good time while she's young. God knows what's ahead of her. Oh, here he is now. I know his friend. We'll go out the side door. Come on, Frank. Good night, Mother. Hey, you want to go to a picture, Clara? I don't care. It's only about 20 after 8. We can get the second show I brought to Columbia. Frank, I wish you'd talk to Amy sometime and tell her what you told me. She won't believe me. I don't suppose she'd believe me either, Mother. Right on the job. Hello. The pride of old West Philly. <laughs> I'll take your hat, Aubrey. Anything to please the ladies. <laughs> the boy rode off with many thanks and many a backward bow. <laughs> you know, Amy, I think I'll have to get a hold of an airship somewhere to come out here to see you. It is quite a trip for you, isn't it? Just one shining hour and a half, if you say it quick. By the little old Brill special. And how is the mother? Say, Amy, wasn't that pulled up in last night's paper somewhere out this way? Yeah, it's right over on Airy Avenue. A doctor's house, wasn't it? Yes, Dr. Donnelly. You know, they say they got nearly $2,000. <laughs> I don't believe that, Amy. Why not? I don't think there's that much money in North Philadelphia. <laughs> It'll be something of my business if you spill any of that dirty old tobacco on my new tablecloth, I'll tell you that. No, oh, I ain't spilling any of it. <laughs> now, who's in there? Wendy? <laughs> What's he doing? Laughing at some more of them uh, West Philadelphia jokes of his? He was asking her about that robbery yesterday morning over at Dr. Donnelly's. And when she told him that the bandits got away with nearly $2,000, he said it couldn't be true that there wasn't that much money in North Philadelphia. Oh, <laughs> shush. <laughs> well, there wouldn't have to be much money up here to be more than one he's got. But do you know, Amy, I discovered tonight that I can save a full 15 minutes on this trip over here by transferring up 29th to the Lehigh Avenue car instead of going on in and up 19th. It is hard to get out of here unless you use the car trolley. I hear some people say it's a great deal quicker. I don't know how they ever found this place. I don't know how you ever found West Philadelphia. Some people think they haven't found it yet. <laughs> Lost somewhere between the Smolkill River and Darby. <laughs> Josie, come away from there. Don't be listening to that damn bladder skype. I wasn't listening to him. I was just seeing what he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was asking her how she ever found this part of town to live in. And she was asking him how he ever found West Philadelphia. And he said West Philadelphia ain't been found yet, that it's lost somewhere between the Schoolkill River and Darby. Well, I wish the hell he'd get lost on one of these nights between here and the school kill river. <laughs> that could kill you too, you know. He's always dying laughing when he gets off one of them bum jokes. <laughs> well, somebody's got to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> That's the time I fooled you, Amy. Leave it to me to put it right over the plate. <laughs> He's got Amy laughing now too. That old clock of ours is stopped again, Neil. Well, it needs fixing. Been fixed twice, didn't do no good. 
So here, uh, yeah, there's, a, there's a fella here that's been uh, left a quarter of a million dollars and he won't take it. Oh, what's the matter with him? Well, ain't nothing the matter with him. He just won't take it. Well, he mustn't be in his right mind, poor boy. I wish somebody leave me a quarter of a million dollars. Oh, you wouldn't know what to do with it if they did. Well, now. What becomes of money like that, Neil, that people won't take? Well, then nothing becomes of it at all. They just come and get it. Who does? Well, the people that won't take it. <laughs> I bet if they left it to me, they wouldn't have to come and take it. <laughs> Who wouldn't have to come and take it? <laughs> Why, the people that won't take it. <laughs> Do you know what the hell you're even talking about, Josie? Yes, I know very well what I'm talking about, but I don't think you do. Well, let me read my paper. No, oh, go and read your paper. I'm sure I don't want to talk to you anyway. Well, Joe, I am going to have that light taken out of the cellar if you don't stop spending all your time down there. You don't want me hammering up here, do you? Well, I don't want you hammering anywhere. I want you out at night and getting some air, not be cooped up in that dusty old cellar. <laughs> <laughs> Who's in there? The Pennsylvania Railroad? Yes, and he's got about as much sense as yourself. You won't say that when you're listening when you're sitting here listening to the Grand Opera. Oh, I won't be listening to it. Don't fret. I got something else to do besides listening to a lot of dagos singing. What's that then? Um, uh... He says when that radio thing is finished, I can sit here and listen to the Grand Opera. What's that, them people singing? Yes, and that goes way up high, you know, that Claire's got on her Victrola. Oh, it's all right if you let it run for a moment. What's the matter? Aubrey wants to drink the water. Oh. Stay right where you are, folks. Right where you are. Just a little social attention. Going right out again on the next train. There you are, Mother. Any woman's fancy, what do you say? Even to the little old carnation. <laughs> Seven United Cats out there, Amy. Customer in here waiting for the old Aqua Pura. Man, it's gotta have something to drink. How about a pop? You'll stay with me on that, won't you? <laughs> Yes, sir, I'd like to tell those of you who have ventured out this evening that this is a very pretty little picture of domestic felicity. Father reading, mother knitting, oh, but then mama is always knitting. <laughs> and little old Tommy Edison over here working 18 hours a day to make the rich man richer and the poor man poorer. How about a popcorn? Shake it up, right or right. God damn it, let me alone. Keep your damn hands to yourself. I've never seen such a damn cat in all my life. Come on. <laughs> Sign on the dotted line. And little old Popsy Wopsy getting sore and going to leave us flat. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, and notwithstanding, Mrs. Fisher, I'd like to mention that the kid from West Philadelphia is giving the growing boy the set and done. And there she is herself, and not a moving picture. Blushing as she gave it, looking down at her feet so bare and her tattered gown. How's that, Mother Fisher? Can't beat that little old Willie Shakespeare, can you? No, sir, I'd like to tell the brothers that Shakespeare party shook a wicked spear. <laughs> well, here's laughter, ladies. And, Mr. Marconi, my best regards to you. I'm afraid it's not very cold. Why didn't you let it run? I did. It just didn't seem to get any colder. Very nice indeed, and a sweeter draught from a fairer hand was never quaffed. Oh, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Joseph, I'd like to tell you you're wasting time, for when you're all through, they'll offer you 20 cents for it and sell it for 20 million. Take it or leave it, sign on the dotted line. Yes, sir, that's exactly what they did to little old yours truly here, 20 Lincoln Anacondas, for a formula that would have solved the greatest problem before the industrial chemical world today. A formula for the prevention of rust in iron and steel. A solution of vanadium and manganese to be added to the metal in its molten state instead of applied externally as they have been doing. 
What did you say, Andre? Well, I said a simple combination of chemical elements to be added to the metal in its molten state, instead of applied externally as they have been doing. But simply because it was discovered by a working man that they saw they couldn't buy, they gave it the swinging door. Yes, I'd rather go on paying a million dollars a year to paint their iron and steel structures throughout the country than pay me. And do you know why, Mrs. Fisher? I'll tell you, because I work for my living. That's the sudden done on the whole business. Keep them poor and get them married. And then, as my darling old mother used to say, you've got them on their beams and hinges. Well, I don't see that anyone's trying to make anyone get married around here. That doesn't want to. Oh, but they do want to, Mrs. Fisher. But the capitalist wants to stop them. Well, I guess it would be just as well to stop some of them. Oh, don't go back on little old William Jennings Bryan, Mother Fisher. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you know. <laughs> Sign on the dotted line. Yes, sir, Amy, I'd like to tell you it's the poor man that gets it every time. <laughs> Rock in the cradle of the deep, I lay me down in peace to sleep. Secure I rest upon the way. For thou alone has the power to save. What time is it now, Joe? Is that him singing in there? The old scientific American himself. To quarter of twelve. My God, what's he starting to sing at this hour for? Talent should never be suppressed at any time, Mother. <laughs> well, it's a wonder Amy wouldn't have stopped him. Never seen a man yet that didn't think he could sing. I don't think Amy knows what time it is, or she would have shut him up. Let the young man express himself. Oh, I could care if he'd bow his head off as far as I'm concerned. I'd be very glad. But I don't want him waking your father up. And that's what he'll be doing, you know, the first thing. And then the bat will be on the fire for sure. <laughs> Ain't that terrible, Joe? Do you think I ought to tell Amy what time it is? No. Give the boy a chance. <laughs> All right. Shush. <laughs> Sign on the dotted line. <laughs> Don't encourage him, for God's sakes, Joe. He's bad enough as it is. Amy? What is it? Well, I am just coming to tell you to put them lights out. I'm going up. It's nearly 12 o'clock. I am also about to take my reluctant leave, Mrs. Fisher. Well, I don't want to hurry you, but... In fact, the recent outburst was in the nature of a farewell concert. <laughs> A little old song of Twilight, you know, to soothe the savage breast. <laughs> the damn fool. Good night, Mrs. Fisher. I guess she's going up, Aubrey. I don't think she's in here, Aubrey. And silence was her answer. <laughs> right you are, Amy. On the right side, she is sleeping. <laughs> Yeah. Is he going? I'm going to sleep. Joe? Come on. Listen, what was that he was saying tonight about discovering something that would keep the rust out of iron and steel? Wasn't that a scream? Well, that's what you're always talking about, ain't it? Yes, I was saying something to him about it one night here while he was waiting for Amy to come down. <laughs> and he's forgot where he heard it. Can you imagine? <laughs> I was wondering if you were getting that tonight. No. Never struck me till afterwards. He's a bird. Well, don't let him see you now, Joe. The vestibule door is shut. Did you put that light out in there? That was a nice trick that people did tonight. What? Everybody walking out of the room while Aubrey was talking. What'd you want us to do? 
Stay here all night listening to him? Well, you wouldn't have had to sit here all night. He was only in here five minutes. Well, that's no thanks to him. We would have been here till morning if someone hadn't done something. What did Pop get into such a temper about? Because he hit him on the back. Well, that was a lot to get mad about. Well, he's always hitting somebody on the back or the shoulder or someplace. And your father said the next time he did it that he was going to walk out of the room. Why, you can't say two words together without hitting somebody someplace. Well, you know, I bet you won't get a chance to insult him again, Mom. I'll tell you that. Well, then let him stop his silly talk, and he won't get insulted. Sign on the dotted line every two minutes and talking about Shakespeare. What kind of going on is that for a sensible man? It's no wonder our Joe says he's a nut. Oh, everybody's a nut with the people around here. Oh, it ain't only the people around here that says it, Amy. Everybody that knows him says it. You needn't laugh, for it's true. Who do you know that knows him? I know Frank Highland. Clara's husband. Yes, Clara's husband. Don't go making things up, Mom. Frank Highland never saw Aubrey Piper. No, didn't he? Oh, no, he didn't. Well, my lady, you're so smart, he knows him better than you do. I don't believe it. Doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. He knows him just the same. He's been looking at him for years down at that restaurant at 15th and Arch where he eats his lunch. And he says he's as crazy as a bass singer. Oh, I suppose that's what Claire was here to tell you about, wasn't it? <clears throat> well, what does it matter who was here to tell it if it's true? Let me tell you something right now, Mom. I want to tell you something to tell our Clara for me the next time you see her to mind her own damn business as far as I'll be Oh, don't fly into a temper if well, anybody the, speaks say to you. things that put me into a temper. Oh, you're not frightening anybody around here. No. Nobody around here is frightening me either. You know, our Clara went and took who she wanted, and I suppose you went and took who you wanted, and if I want Aubrey Piper, I will take him. Well, take him then. And the sooner the better, for it would be a pity to be spoiling two houses with you. Only remember this, Amy. If you do take him, be sure and that you keep him, and that he keeps you. And don't be coming around crying for your pop to keep you. Oh, don't make me laugh. Oh, you can laugh all you like. There's a lot of that kind of laughing going on these days, but nothing will do, but they'll get married. Well, you got married, didn't you? Yes, I did. Well? To a man that was able to keep me. And how do you know Aubrey Piper won't be able to keep his wife? Because I know what he earns, and it isn't enough. You don't know anything about what he earns. He earns $150 a month and not a penny more, for Frank Hyland says so. And what does Frank Hyland know about? Frank knows what he does. His business takes him there all the time. What does he say he does? Why, well, he says he's a clerk, of course, like a hundred others down there. Shows how much he knows about it. But I suppose he told you he owns the Pennsylvania Railroad. Well, you know I'd take his word before I'd take Frank Highland. Why would you take his word before you take Frank Highland's? Well, why shouldn't I? Because he's a fool of a bladder sky. That's only your opinion, Mom. That's the opinion of everybody that ever listened to him. But you believe him before you believe the word of a steady, sensible man. I don't know anything about Frank Highland. You know he's been your brother-in-law for five years. What do you know about this other clown? What do you want to know? I don't want to know anything. I know all I want to know about him. But before I get the name of having a fellow come to see me steady, Amy, there's a few things I'd like to know about him. I'll tell you that. I've told you where he lives. I've told you where he works. What else do you want to oh, know? There is no talking to you, Amy. And there is no use talking to you either. This fellow has got you so crazy mad about him that I believe you'd take him if you knew he had a wife and family someplace and not two cents to his name. You know, I guess I'd get along some way even if I did. All right. Everybody else does. That's the kind of talk that gets them living in garrets and back at their jobs not 10 days after the wedding. Oh, you 
talk as though everybody that gets married is starving to death. There are other ways of starving to death, Amy, besides not getting enough to eat. And the funny part of it is, Amy, like a lot of others, you're very shrewd about money while you're home, as far as what you give your mother and father is concerned. But the minute some clown with a flower in his pocket and patent leather shoes winks at you, you seem to forget that there's such a thing in the world as a ton of coal. And then it's just as our Clara says, it's your people that us to come to the rescue. I wish I'd been here while our Clara was talking. I'd have told her a thing or two. Oh, you needn't try and turn it on to her. She wasn't talking at all. Oh, well, she must have been talking. She simply asked where you were. I told her you were getting dressed and that this fellow was coming over to see you tonight. And then she told me that Frank Highland knew him and knew where he worked and what he got and what he did. Well, you know what, Mom? I would just take him for spite now. Well, let me tell you, Amy, the day a girl that's used to spending money the way you do takes a $35 a week man, the only one she's spiting is herself. Well, I would never ask anybody around here for help, I'll tell you that. Maybe you won't. Oh, don't worry, I won't. Time will tell that, Lady Jane. I've heard the likes of you before. Now, put that light out and go to bed. It's 12 o'clock. She might go out looking for a house today. I suppose she hasn't got back yet. I wanted to take her out to the automobile show tonight. I got the loan of Harry Albright's car. Did you say she was out looking for a house? Yes, we've got to get out of that place we're in. The LePage printing people have bought up the whole block. They're going to put up a new building there. Well, how soon do you have to get out? As soon as we can find a new place, I suppose. I understand they want to begin tearing down there around the first of the year. I'm afraid you won't find it so easy to get a place as reasonable as that again in a hurry. I don't want a place as reasonable as that if I can get something better. I want a, a home, something with a bit of ground around it, where I can do a bit of tennis in the evening if I feel like it. Well, if you do, you'll pay for it. That is exactly what I expect to do, Mother Fisher. Not giving you a short answer. That is exactly what I expect to do. They're not putting up any more houses, from what I can hear. Be yourself now, Mother Fisher. Be yourself. Well, where are they? You ought to go out along the boulevard some Sunday and see what they're doing out there. Well, there's no danger of you going out along the boulevard, except for a walk. A lot of people out that way, Mother. Well, if there is, they're paying for it. Paying more than you're able to pay. Man's got to live somewhere, Mother. Well, if he's wise, he'll live where he's able to pay for it. Besides, you haven't got any furniture for a house, even if you got one, unless you want to be sitting on the floor. The matter of furniture nowadays, little mother, is a very inconsequential item from what I can gather. Well, well you got to price it sometime when you're in the city and see how unconsequential it is. I've investigated the matter very thoroughly, Mother, and I find that there are at least 15 first-class establishments right here in this city that will furnish a man's house from garret to garage and give him the rest of his life to pay for it. 
Um, we need to give some of them the rest of their lives at the rate they're going now. Give the girl and boy a chance, Mrs. Fisher. Give the girl and boy a chance. What are you going to an automobile show for? <laughs> Married five months ago today, Mother. Got to celebrate the happy event. And besides, one never knows what a day will bring in the way of an opportunity to satisfy a long-felt want. And since she knocks but once at each man's door, the kid here doesn't want to miss his chance by any uncertainty as to just what choo-choo he prefers. <laughs> well, got to run along now, Mother. See if Amy's back at the house yet. Well, what do I tell her if she comes after you're gone? Why, tell her I have got the loan of Harry Albright's car, and that I want her to see that new Jordan 6 I was telling her about out at the show. And that'll be at Child's at 15th and Chestnut until 8 o'clock. 15th and Chestnut? That's the said and done, Mother. <laughs> the old Cafe Infante. <laughs> You frightened me, walking in that way like a ghost. When did you come in? A couple minutes ago. I've been in the parlor. Why, your man just left here. Didn't you see him? No, I heard him. Went into the parlor. Well, he's looking for you. He says he wants to take you to some kind of an automobile show with him. Yeah, I know. I didn't want to go. I'm too tired. What's he doing about his supper? Well, I told him earlier to get something in town. I knew I wouldn't be home till late. He says you gotta get out of that place that you're in. Yeah, you know they're gonna tear those places down. That's what I was doing today, <coughs> looking around for some place. Well, did you see anything? Saw a couple places that were fair, but they're asking too much money. Well, I'm afraid that's what you'll find, Amy, wherever you go. $38 a month for a little two-story house that didn't even have a front porch. <laughs> well, you're surely not looking for a house, Amy, are you? Well, yes, if I can find one. And have you any idea what they're asking for houses these days? Well, Aubrey says he won't live in rooms much longer. Oh, what the devil does it matter what he says? It's you that'll have to stretch the money, and the money will only go so far. And the money he gets won't pay any $40 rents. You can make up your mind about that right now before you go any further. He doesn't want to pay rent. He wants to buy. What on? $32 a week? Look, there was a girl in our office that got married just before I got married, and the fellow she married didn't even get as much as Aubrey gets. Gets about 25 a week. He's a guard at the Corn Exchange Bank. And they got a little house out in Kensington, and they say it's beautiful. Mm, she's back at her job, though, isn't she? Well, she never left her job. Well, that's how she's doing it. <sighs> Well, Amy, you haven't got any furniture for a house, even if you've got one. Oh, you can always get furniture. Well, you can if you pay for it. But I don't know how you expect to do these winters later on, when you find it so hard to make ends meet right now, with only the two rooms to pay for, and your everlasting borrowing from me as it is. Well, I always pay you back, don't I? Well, you do when you get it, but that's not the point. It's what you get one week won't last you till the next. The reason I was short this week, Aubrey got that new overcoat. And the next week it's gonna be something else. Listen, man can't be shabby in a position like Aubrey's. No, he says he's got nearly 80 clerks down there where he works. And he says, unless he sets some kind of example of personal appearance, there's some of them that come in in overalls. How much did he pay for that overcoat? $28. Oh, he didn't have to pay it all at once, though. The man said, on account of it being so near Christmas, he'd let it go to 1st February. I guess he'll be wanting a suit now. The first, you know, to go with the overcoat. No. His suit's all right in a while. Mine's beginning to go, though. Wait until I'm tired of looking at it. Well, people can't get things so handy once they're married. I tried to put away some money this week toward a suit. I don't know where the money went, it just seemed to go. I don't know what will become of you, Amy, if ever you have a household of children to keep. I don't know what I'm gonna do, Mom. I'm nearly going crazy. 
Well, I'll tell you what you're going to do if you're a wise woman. You're going to realize that you're married and that you've got some kind of house to keep up and just how much money it's going to be each week to keep it up on. And then you're going to suit your ideas according. And if you don't, Amy, you're going to have plenty of crying to do and you'll have no one to thank but yourself. For you've had nothing but impudence for them that tried to tell you how many beans made five. I guess this is your father. And I haven't even got the potatoes on. Huh?
Suppose he wanted to buy an automobile or something. That's where he is tonight, you know, down at the automobile show and not two cents in his pocket. I think that's what he did want the money for. Well, it wouldn't surprise me, the damn fool. Be more fitter for him to be thinking about getting a house to live in. He doesn't think he needs to think about that. He thinks he's coming in here. Coming in here to live, do you mean? That's what he told Frank the day before yesterday. Well, he is very much mistaken. If he thinks that, I can tell you that. I'd like to be listening to that fella seven days of the week. Rather go live with your Aunt Nellie in Newark. <laughs> <laughs> That's about what you'll have to do, Mom, if you ever let them in on you. Oh, I won't let them in on me. Don't fret. Your father would have something to say about that. Pop might not always be here, Mom. Well, I'll be here if he isn't. And the furniture is mine, and there's very little danger of my walking off and leaving it to any son-in-law, I can tell you that. Well, I guess this is your father right now, and I haven't even got the kettle on. Where's Mom? Oh, the kitchen. Why? Come here. Don't let her hear you. Listen, Clara. Pop had some kind of a stroke this afternoon at his work. Pop did? Yeah, they, they found him lying in front of one of the boilers. Oh my god. I tried to get you on the phone around 4 o'clock. I know, I came right over as soon as I came in. You'd better tell Mom. Joe! What? Where's Pop now? They took him to the Samaritan Hospital. I just came from there. They telephoned me to the office. Well, is he very bad? I think he's done. Don't say that, Joe. That's what the doctor at the hospital says. He hasn't regained consciousness since 3 o'clock. So you'd better tell Mom to get her things and go right down there. I have to change my clothes. I went right out there from work. Joe. What? That Samaritan Hospital is at Broadland, Ontario, isn't it? Yeah. What's the matter, Clara? Wasn't that your pop that came in, Clara? No, it, it was just the boy with the paper. I wonder what's keeping him. He's late tonight. He's nearly always here before this. Clara, what is it? What's the matter with her? I don't know. Something Joe just told her. He went upstairs. What is it, Clara? Something about your father? Is that why you're crying? Why don't you tell her? Go to the foot of them stairs, Amy, and call Joe. There's something that happened to your father. I know it. Now, now it's nothing to get upset about, Mom. Pop just had a stroke of a spell of some kind this afternoon at his work. They've had to take him to the hospital. Joe just came from there. He says we better get our things on and go right down there. Here, sit down here. What you saying happened to your father, Amy? No, it's nothing to get excited about, Mom. It might just be a little heart attack or something that he took. There's never been anything the matter with your father's heart. Well, it, it's pretty hot down there where he works. You know that. And men and pop say you're always having little spells of some kind. I guess it's a stroke, Clara. It might not be, Mom. You can't tell. Well, that's how his two brothers went, you know. Amy, run next door and tell Frank to telephone to tell Frank Highland they won't be home. If he isn't in yet, tell Bertha to tell him to come down to the Samaritan Hospital. And tell Dougie Harbison to go to the corner for a taxi. Is that where your father is? Down at the Samaritan Hospital? Yes, it's right down there near where he works. Oh, your poor father. I wonder what happened to him. No, there's no use looking on the dark side of it already, Mom. No, but me getting his supper out there and him not coming home to it at all and maybe never coming home to it again, Clara, for all we know. He'll be home again, Mom. Pop's a strong man. 
I guess he's dead now. And you're not telling me. He's not dead, Mom. I tell you if he was. Well, what does Joe say? Just what I told you, that he had a spell of some kind. Well, why didn't he tell me? And what's he doing upstairs, anyway? He's changing his clothes. He's got to go right back down there. Well, I guess he's crying, you know. It'll kill our poor Joe if something happens to your father. He says we better go right down there, too, Mom. So you'd better go upstairs and fix yourself up a bit. Give me your apron. I don't know if I can dress myself or not. My hands are like lead. You don't need to get all fixed up. Just put on your black silk waist. That skirt's good enough. Well, I'm not going down there looking like a Dago woman. Nobody will see you in the dark. Well, it won't be dark in the hospital unless something happens to some of the lights. Well, put that gas out under them potatoes, Clara, and you better pick this room up a little bit while I'm upstairs dressing. You never know who might be coming over when they hear about your father. And take them all those papers off that table and put them in the kitchen. I'm so upset. I don't know what I'm doing. You'd better bring your umbrella down there too, Mom. It uh, looked like rain when I came in. And I let our Amy take my rubbers the last day she was here. And she never brings anything back. You won't need rubbers. But I get all my feet wet when I don't have rubbers. My God, what happened to you? It's beginning to rain. Well, never mind the rain. The rain didn't do that to you. I guess you ran into somebody, didn't you? Don't get excited now, Mother. Just a little misunderstanding on the part of the traffic officer. Well, you don't mean to tell me that you ran into a traffic officer, too. Control you? now, little Mother. I assure you there is no occasion for undue solicitation. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Island. Hello. What happened to your head? You look like a bandit. The veriest trifle, Mrs. Highland. Just a little spray from the windshield. Where is the car that you borrowed? <laughs> Smashed, I guess. The car I borrowed, Mother Fisher, is now in the hands of the bandits of the law. The judicial gentlemen who have entered into a conspiracy with the regulators of traffic to collect fines from motorists by ordering them to go one way and then swearing they told them to go another. Never mind your fancy talk. We've heard too much of that already. I want to know who you killed or what you ran into, for I know you ran into something. And where is the automobile that somebody was fool enough to lend you? The automobile, little mother, is perfectly safe park and pasturing in the courtyard of the 22nd and Huntington Park Avenue Police Station. Did you get yourself arrested too? I accompanied the officer as far as the station house, <laughs> yes. And I told them while I was there too, a thing or two about the condition of traffic in this city. I guess they told you a few things too, didn't they? See if my long black coat is in the cellar way there, Clara. This fellow's got me so upset, I don't know what. to cover themselves up as gracefully as possible by trumping up a charge against me of driving an automobile without a license. <laughs> what did they do? Take the automobile away from you? Oh, nothing of the sort. They simply complied with the usual procedure in a case of this kind, which is to release the defendant on bond, pending the extent of the victim's injuries. Was there somebody injured? The traffic cop that ran into me, yes. For God's sake, couldn't you find anyone but the traffic cop to run into? Uh, I did not run into him, Mrs. Island. You don't understand the circumstances of the case. <laughs> I understand this much about them. They can give you ten years for a thing like that. They'd serve you just right if they did, too. Borrowing people's automobiles and knowing no more about running them than I did. No time like the present to learn, Mrs. Island. <laughs> well, you'll very likely have plenty of time from now on. That officer is seriously injured. Hey, he was faking a broken arm around there when I left. <laughs> <laughs> was he in a car too? No, he was jaywalking, trying to beat me to the crossing after giving me the right of way. Where did this thing happen? Broad and Erie Avenue. I wouldn't kid you. Did they take the cop to the hospital? Yes, we took him over there in the car. Did they let you run it? Uh, repeat the question, Mrs. Highland. You heard me. I don't need to repeat myself. 
take that silly book and get him to drop your head before Amy sees you. And don't frighten the life out of her. Is my wife here? She's next door telephoning, yes, and she'll be back in a minute. Pop had some kind of stroke this afternoon at his work. Joe just told us. What are you doing, kidding me? I'm not kidding you. What would I be kidding you about a thing like that for? Where is he now? At the Samaritan Hospital. We're just going down there now. What's the matter, Aubrey? Well, the old kid herself. What is it, Aubrey? Nothing in the world but this, baby. Did you get Frank on the phone, Amy? Uh, no, he wasn't home yet. I told the girl to tell him as soon as he came in. Clara, is that automobile cab here yet? It'll be here in a minute, Mom. What'd you think of that fellow, Amy? Running wild through the city and breaking policemen phones? We had enough trouble without that, with your poor father dead for all we know, down in the Jewish hospital. It's enough to make a party light headed. Where's your coat, Mom? Well, isn't it in the cellar right there? No, it just looks. Oh, it must be upstairs. Joe! Well, listen, Joe! I had a little mix-up at Broad and Erie Avenue. Well, you didn't get hurt, did you? Throw down my long black coat, you'll find it on a hook there the in the hall closet. closet. Just a little shake-up. He nearly killed a police officer. That's how much of a little shake-up it was. You didn't, did you? Certainly not, Amy. Your mother's raving. The man is in the hospital. I don't know what more you want. Is he, Aubrey? Think I'd be here, kid, if it was? <laughs> you wouldn't be here. Oh! Only that someone was fool enough to bail you out instead of letting you stay where you could be someplace safe and not killing people. Joe, why don't you tell a lie when you're gonna throw a thing down that way and not be frightening the life out of people? Aren't you gonna put on another waist, Mom? Nah, this one's good enough. I'll keep the coat buttoned up. Put that collar inside, Clara. Are you out on bail, Audrey? <laughs> they always bail a man in a case like this, Amy. They've got my car on their hands. Get my hat, will you, Clara? Where is it, upstairs? No, it's in the parlor there, inside the top of the Ventrola. <laughs> Why don't you bring your car back with you, Audrey? The fellow might want it tomorrow. Oh, I'll have it for him, all right. I've got to call around there Monday morning at 10 o'clock for it. I guess you gotta go to a hearing there. Monday morning at 10 o'clock and pay at 5. I guess that's the automobile he's got to call for. You better go out and get a whisk room and dust this, Mom. Oh, never mind. It's good enough. Give it to me. Your coat needs dusting. How much did they find you, Aubrey? They didn't find me at all. They'll do that Monday morning. The time will tell that, Mother Fisher. And they'll pay it, too, or go to jail. And that would be just the price of you. They didn't seem very anxious to do any fighting today after I got through telling it to them. Am I all right, Clara? I took a slam at the Pennsylvania Railroad, too, while I was at it. You're always taking a slam at something. I guess that's what's leaving you under bail right now. Are you ready, Clara? Yes, I'm ready. Never mind about that, Mother Fisher. Well, come on down, Joe. Are you coming there? Well, we don't be very surprised when you hear of a very quiet little shake-up very soon in the Department of Public Safety. Are you sure that that coat is warm enough on you, Clara? Yes, I'm all right. How about your umbrella? Oh, I think it's out there in the hall. Right, look we'll and see. How much bail did they put you under, Aubrey? A thousand berries, Amy. A thousand dollars? That's regulation. A little chicken feed for the school pigeons. Did he say they put him under bail for a thousand dollars? That's what I said, Mrs. Fisher. One thousand trifles. I wouldn't kid you. You wouldn't kid anyone that had listened to you for five minutes. And who did you get to go your bail for a thousand dollars? Don't be alarmed, Mother Fisher. I saw that the affair was kept strictly within the family. Well, what do you Ooh. mean? Your other son-in-law was kind enough to come forward. Clara's husband? That's the gentleman, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Francis X. Highland. My God, did you hear that, Clara? What? He got Frank Highland to go his bail for a thousand dollars. What did you do? 
write him another letter? That was not necessary. Not giving you a short answer. Your husband was fortunate enough to see the whole affair from the trolley car. He was just returning from his business, and he happened to be on the trolley car that ran into me. How many more things ran into you besides traffic cops and trolley cars? I suppose a couple of the buildings ran into you, too, didn't they? Are you ready, Mom? Yes, we're ready. You'll find out all about that Monday morning. Well, Fisher. see that nothing else runs into you between now and Monday. We don't want Frank Hyland losing any thousand-dollar bills on account of you. What's the matter? Why, this crazy Jack's been running wild through the city and hitting everything but ourselves. Got himself arrested, and Frank Hyland had to go with bail for a thousand dollars. What were you doing, Aubrey? Joy riding? No, he was traffic cop riding and trolley <laughs> car riding and everything else riding in an automobile that he borrowed. I think I see the taxi coming, Mom. Oh, come, come here, Joe. How do we get down there, Clara? Right down here, yeah. Too bad I left that car down there at the station house. I could have run you down there. <laughs> you wouldn't run me down there, not if you had a thousand cars. There's enough of us in the hospital as it is. And don't you come down there, neither, for you'd only start talking, and that would finish pop quicker than a stroke. Come on. Are you coming out of the hospital, Amy? Uh, no, Amy, you better be here. There better be some one of us here. That fellow be running into something else. You ought to have something heavier on you than that coat. I'm aware of. Have you got your coat buttoned up good, Joe? Where is your toupee, Aubrey? <laughs> oh, it's uh, well, in my pocket here. <laughs> Oh, not a bit, honey. It's just a couple of little scratches. I think they'll do to you down there, Monday. Now, don't you worry, sweetheart. I'll be right there if they try to pull anything. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't had anything to drink, had you, Aubrey? Who? Me? Well, I thought someone might have treated you or something. <laughs> I had a glass of champagne six months ago with a friend of mine in his suite at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, and I haven't had a drink of anything since. Let me take your coat, Aubrey. We'll have to wait here till they get back. Yes, I guess we will. I wonder how your father is. Not too good, I guess. Otherwise, they wouldn't have telephoned for Joe. Did they telephone for Joe? Yes, send for him to the place where he works. Your mother said it was a stroke. It's probably what it is, too. His two brothers died that way. I'm sorry to hear that, Amy. But you mustn't worry now, kid. It isn't only that I'm worried about. I'm worried about you, Monday. You know, don't you know, baby, I tell you if there was anything to worry about? The traffic laws in this city have gotten so strict, and there have been so many automobile accidents lately. They're only strict, honey, when a man is driving under the influence of liquor. That traffic cop was her dad. Uh, it would be only a fine for reckless driving, even if they could prove it was reckless driving. And I can prove it was the copper's fault. So they'll very likely be apologizing to me around there Monday morning instead of finding me. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't mind if they only find you. I could go back to work till it was paid off. You'll never go back to work while I'm on the boat, kid. I wouldn't mind. Not while you're my wife, Amy. I'd rather leave the Pennsylvania Railroad flat and go out and take one of the jobs that have been offered me where they pay a man what he's worth. I don't think they'll do anything else to you down there, Monday, do you? Oh, they might try to take away my license. You haven't got a license, have you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I neglected to attend to it this year. They can find you for that, can't they? Driving an automobile without a license, you mean? Yeah. Sure, they can find you for anything, unless you know how to beat them to it. Mm -hmm. What is it they send you to prison for, Aubrey? Oh, wonder who that is. Do you want me to answer it? Yes, it might be something about Pop. Does my head look all right? <laughs> it looks all right, Aubrey. Wait a minute. Uh, hurry up, Aubrey. All right, all right. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Is this a Mr. Fisher lives? This is Mr. Fisher's residence, yes, sir. What can I do for you? So I got some things that the boss asked me to leave. Oh, just step in here, would you? Getting a little colder, I think. 
Look, boy, ain't time now. Uh, just step in this way, would you? Mm. There's a gentleman here, Amy, with some things belonging to your father. Good evening. Good evening. This is my wife, Mrs. Piper. How do you do? Mrs. Piper is Mr. Fisher's daughter. The rest of the folks have gone down to the hospital. I see. Have you heard anything from the hospital yet? Not yet, no. We hadn't heard anything at all until 15 minutes ago. That's too bad. Those hospitals won't tell you anything. Do you work with my father? No, ma'am. I'm a twister on the second floor, but uh, one of the machinist helpers knows that uh, I live out this way. So, yes, me to stop by with these things on my way home. Thanks. Here's uh, the hat and the overcoat and, and his lunch. Thanks. If man says if there's anything else, uh, he'll tell me. I don't suppose there is anything else. If there is, I'll bring it up. Thanks. We're so much obliged to you. <laughs> Who is this McMahon? Uh, he's one of machinist helpers down there. I see. Uh, were you there when my father was taken ill? Uh, no, ma'am. I wasn't. I don't think anybody was there, to tell you the truth. McMahon says he talked to him about a quarter of three, and when he came back from the annex at three o'clock, he, he found him laying there in front of number five. Very likely a little touch of a vagina, Victoria. Uh, the doctor down there says he thought it was a straw. Uh, same thing. Ah. Uh, will you sit down, mister? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, I can't stay. I gotta get along home. Oh, uh, that's Mrs. Harbison. I'll go. Do you live up this way, Governor? No, I live out uh, Richmond Way. I see. I take the number 32 over Allegheny Avenue. Well, too bad my car's laid up. I could have run you out there. Oh, it's all right. The trolley takes you right to the door. Had to turn it in Thursday to have the valves ground. <laughs> I want it on the telephone for a moment, Aubrey. Please excuse me. That's all right, ma'am. I got to get along yourself. Very likely some work from the hospital. Uh, I hope it ain't any bad news. Well, you know you've got to be prepared for most anything, Governor, when a man gets up around the old three-score mark. That's true. A lot of them push off about that age. Especially when a man's worked hard all his life. Well, I guess Mr. Fisher worked pretty hard. Not an excuse in the world for it, either. I've said it to him a thousand times if I've said it to him once. Well, Pop, when are you going to take the big rest? Oh, he'd say, I'll have plenty of time to rest when I'm through. Ah, I guess when you worked as hard as Mr. Fisher all his life, it's hard to just quit all of a sudden. Well, he wouldn't have to quit exactly. I mean, he's a handyman. He could putter around the house. There are lots of things around here that I'm not any too well satisfied with. But is Mr. Fisher's <laughs> wife living? Yes, she's here with us too. That makes it nice. Yes, well, it's a pretty big house here. So when I married last June, I said, come ahead, the more the merrier. <laughs> oh, she's a pretty big house, dude. Yes, they don't make them like this anymore, Governor. Oh yeah, you got most of the streets to get all any kind of house these days. Yes, yeah, well, I have a friend here in town who's very close with the city architect, and he was able to fix it for me. It's a nice street. Nice in summer. I was surprised when I saw it, because when I asked the taxi cab driver down there, he says he never heard of it. You never heard of Crescent Street? No, he said not. You must be an awful straw ride. I had to ask the police officer. Well, I'll tell you, Governor, I don't suppose they get many calls for taxi cabs up this way. You see, most everyone in through here has his own car. I see. Some have a half dozen for that matter. <laughs> it certainly is plenty of them knocking around. All over the ice. Oh, this way, Governor. Oh, excuse me. That door goes into the park. You know, the, the, a guy down at the corner store says there was some uh, smash up about half an hour ago down at Broad and Erie Avenue. Is that so? Yeah, he says some nut was smashing into everything in sight. <laughs> he, he knocked out a police officer and broke his arm. Can you imagine what the two of that guy not that traffic cop down? What was the matter with him? Was he stewed? No! The fellow down there says it was just some kind of nut! He says the car didn't even belong to him. He must have gotten it somewhere. They took it away from him and pinched him, so he's not running to anybody else for a while. <laughs> traffic is in pretty bad shape in this town right about now. Oh, it certainly is! Why, yes, fellas not safe walking down the sidewalk these days. But. I hope your wife will have some good news. Well, while there's life, there's hope, you know. That's right. Don't just look out on the dark side of things. Well, where do you get your car, Governor? Well, I just get one in the corner and I transfer. Oh, it. so you can. Well, we're ever so much obliged to you. Ah, don't mention it. Good night, sir. Good night. When did you come in, Amy? I came in the side door. Thought that man would still be here. Well, kid. What's the good word? No, Aubrey. Pop is dead. Don't let it get you, honey. You have nothing to regret and nothing to fear. 
The kid from West Philly will never go back on you. You know that, don't you, baby? You know that, don't you, Amy? Amy. What? You know I'm with you, don't you? Yes. Don't cry, honey. The old man's better off than we are. He knows all about it now. What do you suppose we ought to do, Aubrey? There's nothing we can do that I can see, sweetheart, except sit tight till the folks get back. They'll be down there themselves in a few minutes now, and they'll know all about it. They say Pop died at a quarter to six. Was that the hospital on the telephone? Yes. Something we ought to have in here, Amy, a telephone. Not be letting the whole neighborhood in on our business. You know, Pop used to sit in that chair over there. It would be funny not to see him sitting there anymore. The old gent had to go sometime. Your mother will have you and me to comfort her now. I don't know how she's going to get along just on Joe's pay. Why don't you say something to her about letting us come in here? She'll need a man in the house. My salary will cover the rent. Well, Mom doesn't have to pay rent, Aubrey. She owns this house. <laughs> you know, Pop wrote out the will just a week after we were married. Claire had to do it. Who's the executor, do you know? Claire is. Too bad your father didn't make me the executor of that will. I could have saved him a lot of money. Suppose he thought on account of her being the oldest. I wonder why your father never liked me. Pop never said he didn't like you, Aubrey. I always tried to be clubby with him. I used to slap him on the back whenever I spoke to him. <laughs> Pop was always very quiet. And the kid from West Philly had too much to say. Well, forgive and forget. It's all over now, and the old man can be as quiet as he likes. You haven't had anything to eat today, have you, Aubrey? Oh, don't worry about me, sweetheart. It'll be all the same at the finish, whether I've had my dinner or not. Sic transit gloria mundi. And we never get used to it. The paths of glory lead but to the grave. Yet we go on, building up big fortunes, only to leave them to the generations yet unborn. Well, so it goes. And so it will always go, I suppose. Sic transit gloria mundi. What does that mean, Aubrey? Sic transit gloria mundi? Why, it's an old saying from the French, meaning <laughs> we're here today and gone tomorrow. I'm worried about tomorrow, Aubrey. What are you worried about, sweetheart? Monday. Now, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You know that, don't you, baby? But you haven't got a license, and if that traffic cop was badly injured... Don't you worry about it, sweetheart. We're here today, and if he was badly injured, we'll know all about it on Monday. Sick transit gloria mundi. <laughs> Now, Mrs. Fisher, if you'll just sign this paper right over here. Right here? That's right. And once again, if you would, Mrs. Fisher. In the same place? Yes, sign on the dotted line. <laughs> it's just a duplicate. Here's the pen. Thank you. And here you are, Mrs. Fisher. One thousand dollars. Thank you. Well, that's the money we like to pay, Mrs. Fisher. And the money we don't like to pay. No, things like this are never very pleasant when this kind of money is being paid out, Mr. Rogers. Well, at least it doesn't make things any less pleasant, Mrs. Fisher. No, I'm sure I don't know what a lot of folks would do without it. Well, it's very hard to convince many of them of that, Mrs. Fisher. Yes, I, I guess we don't think much about trouble when we're not having it. A lot of people think they're never going to have trouble and they're never going to need a dollar. They're very foolish. Very foolish indeed. Everybody will have trouble if they live long enough. Yes, indeed. Well, now, what do I do with this check, Mr. Rogers? Why, anything you like, Mrs. Fisher. You can deposit it, you can have it cash, just Whatever you like. Frank will get a cash for you, Mom, downtown. I'm not used to having thousand dollar checks, you know, Mr. Rogers. I'm not very used to them either, Mrs. Fisher. 
except to give them to somebody else. <laughs> well, will you take this then, Clara, and give it to Frank Highland? Yes, I'll give it to him tonight. Oh, Mrs. Fisher, would you give this to your son-in-law, Mr. Piper? What is it? Well, it's a little description of a very attractive accident policy that our company has just came out with. And I was talking to Mr. Piper about it when I called for Mrs. Fisher's policy, and he seemed very interested. In fact, I find that people are a lot more susceptible to the advantages of a good insurance program when they actually see one being paid out to somebody else. Now, this particular policy here, it's a kind of a combination of accident, life insurance, disability, and a dividend benefit. Why, we can tell there is not another product on the market today with the return and stability of that product right there it is. <laughs> we think it's almost benevolent. <laughs> well, how much is it for? Well, you know, we have them for $10,000, but Mr. Piper, he wanted our $50,000 policy. <laughs> well, no, it's no wonder she's laughing, Mr. Rogers. Her view of Mr. Piper as well as she does, you'd laugh too. He's got about as much notion of taking out a $50,000 policy as I have, and just about as much chance of paying for it. But he, he seemed very interested, Mrs. Fisher. He was showing off, Mr. Rogers, what he's always doing. But that fellow don't make enough salary in six months to be paying a year's premium on a policy like that. Well, it's, it's very strange that he, he would talk about it at all if he had no intention of taking it. He never has any idea when he talks, Mr. Rogers. <laughs> That's the reason he does it so much. It's no effort. <laughs> it's particularly funny, because I have talked to him about the $10,000 policy, but he was only interested in the $50,000 accident policy. Well, I can understand him being in interested in the accident part of it after last Monday. I suppose you heard about him running into everything last Monday night, <laughs> didn't you, down on Broad Street and Erie Avenue? That was Mr. Piper! <laughs> that was him. He ran into a traffic officer and broke his arm. Well, I saw that in the paper, but our paper said Pepper, not Piper. Well, it was spelled Piper in our paper. Well, what would they do about that, Mrs. Fisher? <laughs> well, he's down there today at the magistrate's getting his hearing. God knows what they'll do with him, for he didn't own the automobile he was driving and didn't have a license to drive. Yeah, that, 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 that's really unfortunate. But he'll very likely tire the magistrate out so with his talk that the man will discharge him just to get rid of him. Well, well he certainly won't want to see me when he comes back today, Mrs. Fisher. He may not be back for six months. <laughs> well, let's hope it doesn't come to that. Good afternoon, Mrs. Hyman. Good afternoon, Mrs. Fisher. Good afternoon, Mr. Rogers. <laughs> I'm glad you were here. I don't understand them insurance papers. <laughs> what do you think you'll do with all that money, Mom? Why, I think I'll put it in a bank somewhere. Everything's paid for, and then I'll have something in my old days. Do you want me to put the check right into the bank for you? No, I want to see the money first. <laughs> but can you believe that clown, Clara, talking about a $50,000 policy and him in debt up to his eyes? What does it matter, Mom? You could never change a man like Piper. No, but... I hate to see him making such a fool of Amy and all of us with his name and all the papers and the whole city laughing at him. He doesn't mind that, Mom. He likes it. But Amy's married to him, Clara. That's the trouble. Amy doesn't mind it either, Mom, as well, long as it's Aubrey. She ought to mind it. She's got any pride. She's in love with him, Mom. She doesn't see him with the same eyes that other people do. Oh, you're always talking about love. You give me a pain. Don't you think she is? Well, how do I know whether she's in love or not? I don't know anything about people being in love. 
except they act silly, most everybody that I know that ever was. She might have taken worse, Mom. He does his best, he works every day, and he gives her his money. No one ever heard of him looking at another woman. But he's such a rattle brain, Clara. <laughs> There are harder things to put up with in a man than that, Mom. I know he's terribly silly and talks too much, but I don't know. I feel sorry for him. He'd so love to be important, and of course he never will be. Well, I swear I don't know how she stands the everlasting talk of him. He's been here nearly a week, and I'm telling you, Clara, I'm just about lightheaded. I'll be glad when they go. I'd rather have a man that talked too much, Mom, than one of those silent types. Honestly, sometimes I think if Frank Highland doesn't say something, I'll go out of my mind. Well, what do you want him to say? <laughs> Anything. Just so I know he had a voice. Well, he's too sensible a man, Claire, to be talking when he's got nothing to say. I don't think it's so sensible, Mom. Never to have anything to say. Well, lots of men are that way in the house. But there are children there. It isn't so bad. Well, if Amy ever has any children, and they have as much to say as their father, I don't know what will become of her. She'll get along some way. People always do. By leaning on someone else, that's how they get along. But if she's in love with the man she's married to, and he's in love with her, their children? I never saw such a married woman so full of love. I suppose that's because I never had any of it, Mom. Don't your man love you? He loved someone else before he met me. Well, how do you know? The way he talks sometimes. Why didn't he marry her? I think he lost her. I remember one time he said to me, Always be kind, Clara, to anyone that loves you. For he said, a person always loses what he doesn't appreciate. And he said, it's a terrible thing to lose love. He said, you never realize what it was worth until you've lost it. I think that's why he gives Piper a hand once in a while. Because he sees Amy's in love with him, and he wants to make things easy for her. Because I have an idea. He made things pretty hard for the woman that loved him. Well, a body can't have everything in this world, Clara. Oh, maybe this is them now. What happened to Amy? Where's Aubrey Piper? He's coming. Is Frank with him? Yes. Are you sick? No. Well, you look sick. Well, I have a headache. We had to wait in line so long. Why don't I get you a glass of water? Will I make you a cup of tea? No, no bother, Mom. I can do it myself. It won't take a minute. What did they do to Aubrey down there? Find him. A thousand dollars. Recklessness and driving without a license. Did Frank pay it? Yes. I told him I'd be responsible for it. How can you ever pay him back a thousand dollars, Amy? I can go back to work. I can always go back to the office. Well, it was either that or six months in jail, and we <coughs> said we couldn't have that. Was there anybody there that we know? I didn't see anybody. Was the traffic cop there? Yes. There were 14 witnesses. You know, the traffic <laughs> cop's arm was broken, and the fellow that owned the car was there, too. When do you think you'll go back to work? As soon as I get settled. You know, there's no use in me going back now. I only have to leave again pretty soon. Amen. Does Mom know? Haven't told her yet. Don't worry about it, Amy. I wish to God it was me. <laughs>
Hello, Mother. Hello, Frank. You're looking good, Mother. Well, I'm not feeling good, Frank. I can tell you that. Oh, what's the trouble? Well, I'm troubled to think of all the bother you've been put to in this business. Yeah. Oh, don't worry about that, Mother. We're going to have a little bother once in a while. What did they do down there today, Frank? Why, they... I'll tell you what they tried to do. Oh, shut up, you. Nobody wants to hear what you've got to say about it at all. I told them down there what I had to say about it, whether they wanted to hear it or not. I guess they let you go just to get rid of you. Why don't you take your coat off, Frank? Oh, I've got to meet that fellow at North Philadelphia Station at 4 o'clock. What did they say to that fellow down there today, Frank? Oh, nothing very much, Mother. Just a little reprimand for driving without a license. Well, didn't they find him for breaking that man's arm? Little, but not very much. You see, that was more or less the nature of an accident. Well, how much was it? Now, Mrs. Fisher, as Aubrey says, it's all washed up and signed on the dotted line. <laughs> Well, I bet you paid it, Frank, whatever it was, for I know he didn't have it. Well, Mother, you know, it's getting near Christmas. We all got to give a little present here and there. Well, I hate to see you running around paying for that fellow's mistakes. It's all we're really doing in this world, Mother. Paying for somebody's mistakes and somebody paying for ours, I suppose. Well, don't seem right to me. Well, Mother, when you made a few mistakes that can't be paid for, well, you make up for them by paying for those that can. Will you be home for dinner tonight, Frank? What would you say? I say, will you be home for dinner tonight? Oh, I don't think so. More than likely have to have dinner with him. Good night, Mother. Good night, Frank. Good night, dear. Good night. Listen, Clara. What? Didn't he tell you how much they find, Aubrey? He did, Mom, really. Didn't she tell you when I was out putting the tea on? Well, what does it matter, Mom? You won't have to pay it. Well, I'll find out. It'll very likely be in the evening paper. Don't say anything to her, even if it is. Amy has enough to bother her now. Ah, she's brought it on herself, if she has. No one could tell her anything. There's nothing to be done by fighting with her, Mom. Well, there's nothing can be done by anything once the main thing is done, and that's the marriage. That's where all the trouble starts, getting married. If there were no marriages, Mom, there'd be no world. Oh, everybody says that. <laughs> if there'd be no marriages, there'd be no world. Well, would there? Well, what if there wouldn't? Would it be any worse than it is now? <laughs> A lot of whippets getting married, not two cents to their name, and then throwing themselves on the people that keep them. They're so full of love before they're married. They're not the only one I ever heard talking about love after they got married. It's no wonder you have a roof over your head, or they never have with that kind of talk. Like the two of them there in the parlor that has to kiss every time they meet on the floor. Amy's going to have a child, Mom. Why didn't she tell me? I suppose she thought it'd start a fight. Well, I don't know why it would start a fight. I never fight with anyone. <laughs> Except him, and I wouldn't fight with him only for his impudence. Has Amy said anything to you about coming in here to live? Well, she said something about it the night your father was laid out, but I wasn't paying much attention to her. I think you ought to let her come in here, Mom. She'd be company for you now that Pop's gone. And who knows what day Joe might take a notion to get married. Well, what's changed your mind so much, Claire, about letting her come in? You were very much against it when she was married. I'd be against it still. Things around here were the way they were then. You didn't even own this house, Mom. It was Pops when they were married. And I knew if anything ever happened to him, and there was no will, you might not find it so easy to order anybody out of it. It's not that I would mind letting Amy come in, Clara, but I don't want to please him. For I know the first thing I'd know is he'd be telling everyone that he let me come in. Oh, I wouldn't put it past him. He's told bigger lies than that. 
And if I ever found out that he did that, he'd be out of here in five minutes, bad and baggage. Now see who that is, Clara. Amy? Yes, Are what you, is it? The kettle's boiling out here if you want a cup of tea. All right. Would you like a cup of tea, Aubrey? Oh, no thanks, honey. I don't care for any just now. Everything will be all right, kid. You know me. How do you do? How do you do? And how is the young man? I can't complain. Is this my father's watch? Yes, ma'am. He was to fish his dog. Yes. I believe my mother gave my father this watch when they were married. And Thanks ever so much. The man said uh, he didn't see it before. He found it on the time chart back in number five. I this see. is the gentleman that brought Pop's other thing, so. Oh, is that so? I stopped by the day Mr. Fisher died. How is it you're not working today, Governor? Well, Mondays and Tuesdays and Mealies is a rule. I see. But the hunkies they always bring this stuff up to us. You gotta keep right after them. Well, I guess I'll be getting along. I'm never so much obliged to you for bringing this watch up. Don't mention it. Yeah, I'm just sorry about the reason I have to do it. Yes, it was very sad. M Mr. Fisher was a hard working man. I suppose he worked too hard for his age. Yes, I, I guess he did. You couldn't stop him, though. And that's what your brother-in-law was telling me the day I was here, how he kept trying to get him to quit and take a rest, but I uh, guess when he worked as hard as Mr. Fisher all his life, it's hard to quit all of a sudden. I guess you're right. <laughs> you, you, Mr. Piper, I, I didn't know that was you that was in that smash-up I was talking about the day I was here. That's so. I didn't know about it until I saw your picture in the paper the next day. What paper did you see it in? Uh, I saw it in the record. Oh, it wasn't a very good picture of me, was it? I knew it was you, though, the minute I saw it. A friend of mine loaned me his car while mine was laid up, and something went wrong with the steering gear. How'd you make out about that traffic car? Oh, I squared that up all right. Where do you live up here? Well, I live out uh, Richmond Way. I like to get a place here on account of being closer to work, but I, I don't think there's much chance. No, I don't know if any vacant houses around here now. Nah, your brother-in-law was telling me at the time you had to kind of get this one. But I guess I'll be getting along. <laughs> well, thanks ever so much, Mr. Rob. Yeah, don't mention it. I'm sure my mother will be glad to have this watch. I'll bet she has it than one of them hunkies down there. <laughs> Goodbye and thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Listen, Aubrey, what do you mean by telling people that this is your house? I didn't tell anybody it was my house. You must have told this man or he wouldn't have said so. Well, what do you think I am, a liar? Yes, I do, one of the best I know. Well, I ask Amy what I said to him. She was here when I was talking to I her. I don't have to ask anybody anything. You were lying to him here today in front of me. What did I say? They fixed the automobile thing up. It's fixed up, isn't it? You didn't fix it up. You'd have gone to jail for six months, if only for Frank Highland. And telling this man you tried to persuade Pop to stop working? So I did. When? I didn't say it to him. <laughs> but I told Amy he ought to stop. And I think he'd be right here today if he'd taken my advice. He wouldn't be right here today if he'd stop expecting you to keep him. Now listen to me, Aubrey. You've made a lot of trouble for us since you've been in this family, and I want you to stop it. There's no reason my husband, because he happens to have a few dollars, should be going around paying your bills. What do you want me to do? I want you to stop telling lies, for that's about all anything you do amounts to. Trying to make people believe you're something you're not, when if you just quit your talking and you're showing off, you might actually be the thing you're trying to make them believe that you are. Your wife's going to have a child one of these days, Aubrey. And you want to pull yourself together and try to be sensible, like the man of a family should be. You're smart enough. There's no reason a man like you is living in two rooms above a barber shop. I should think you'd have more respect for your wife. A man doesn't stand much chance of getting ahead, Claire, when the boss has got a grudge against him. Well, stop your silly talk and get rid of that carnation. The boss might get rid of his grudge. But what I wanted to tell you was this, Aubrey. I've asked Mom to let you and Amy come in here to live. And she says she wouldn't mind it, 
only that she knows the first thing she'd hear is that you told someone you'd taken her in. And you see, that's exactly what you've done with this man that brought the watch. If I told Mom that, there'd be war. Are you going to tell her? I'm going to put that up to you. But the very first thing I hear that you've told anyone that this is your house, I'll see to it that you get a house that will be your own. <laughs> I suppose your mother would have something to say about that, Clara. The only thing that needs to worry you is what I'll have to say about it. This house is mine. Pop left it to me, so Mom would always have a roof over her head. For he knew how long she'd have it if Amy ever got around her. And if Amy ever got hold of it, he knew what she'd do if it came to a choice between you and Mom. What are you doing? Kidding me? <laughs> giving you a tip. See that you keep it to yourself. Be wise now, Aubrey. You've got a chance to sit in here and live like a human being. And if you throw that away, you've no one to blame but yourself. The paper should be here by now. Where's Clara, Aubrey? Uh, out on the front porch, I think. How are you feeling? A little better. Just had some tea. But listen, Aubrey. Mom said we could come in here to stay. Yes, I got Clara to fix it up. She <laughs> said we could have my room. Is it a front room? No, it's the one at the head of the stairs. You look nice in black, Amy. Thank you. This is the dress that Claire gave me. It's right here in the paper about the trial today. Keep it out of sight and don't let Mom see it. I'll bring it upstairs. Uh, has it got my picture in it? <laughs> Supper tonight, Clara. Yes, I might as well, Mom. Frank won't be home. I think I'll run next door and telephone Bertha to tell her I won't be home. I told Amy she could have that side room upstairs. She might as well be using it, Mom. But I know I'm not going to hit it with him. Better to be fighting than lonesome, Mom. Solutions. Stop, Joe! Did they buy the thing for you? One hundred thousand dollars in there. <laughs> the buyers in Stevens people? Yes. They sent for me this afternoon about two o'clock. So I knocked off and got hold of Farley right away and we went over there. They had the contracts all drawn up and everything. What'd you say about a hundred thousand dollars, Joe? <laughs> they paid that today on account. Then they're to market it for me from their laboratories and give me half the net. What's the net? <laughs> What's left after all expenses are paid? Well, I guess they'll see that there ain't much left, won't they? Why, there'll be a fortune out of this thing, Mom. Do you have any idea what a rust preventative means or the chemical industrial problem? Why, they'll make a million dollars out of this. 
within the next five years. Well, how much of that are you going to get, Joe? I get the same as they get. That's the contract. A million dollars? Easy. I got a hundred thousand today. <laughs> well, how many knots in a hundred thousand? That's uh, one and two knots. Uh, three more knots. They paid that today on account. I knew it was coming, though. Their head chemist out at Bristol told me six weeks ago it was all set. I've got to go over to their office. They made an appointment with the newspaper and magazines people. I've got to talk to them. Well, did they give you any of the money, Joe? A hundred thousand dollars, sure. Well, not in money, though. Not in dollar bills, no. They gave me a check for it. Well, where is it? Farley has it in his safe down in his office. Well, how much do you have to give him? Half of it? No. He's, he's just my lawyer. He's not a partner. I give him 5% of all money's received. Well, how much will that be? That was 5000 right off the bat today. Pretty soft for that bird. When I first talked to him, he wanted to stick me for 10%. But I nailed that down quick. I knew what this was going to be worth. Well, what are you going to do, Joe? Stop working? No, of course not. I'm not going to stop working. I've got that oil paint thing on the carpets now. Well, wouldn't you have to go to Washington or someplace? No, that's all been intended to. But I might go to Trenton. New Jersey? <laughs> Yeah. Not to live, surely. <laughs> I might, till I get this oil paint thing through. Well, I think you'd be very foolish, Joe, to be going to Trenton at your age. Well, the Myers and Stevens people made me a proposition that looks pretty good. They've got one of the most perfectly equipped experimenting laboratories in the world, just outside of Trenton. And it's open to use day and night. And that's what I want. I'd have had this rust preventative thing through six months sooner if I had had the use of a laboratory somewhere at night. So they want me to go up there on a salary with a first look at anything I strike. But I didn't want to say anything until I talked to you. Well, what do you mean? I don't like the idea of going away and leaving you alone in the house. Oh, you go ahead, Joe. It's for your good. I don't like the Never idea. Never mind about me. I'll get along somehow. <laughs> I don't like the idea of leaving you here alone. Nearly every mother is left alone, Joe, if she lives long enough. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, Mom, why Amy couldn't come in here. She's in here already. Her man with her. I mean, to stay. They're going to stay. She's having that side room upstairs. They're going to have to live someplace, and I guess it'll have to be here. Just like our Clara said here one night, I remember it as if it were yesterday. She said, remember what I'm telling you, Mom. It's you that'll have them on your hands. And I suppose that's true. She made her bed, and I guess it'll be me that'll have to lie in it. <laughs> they want me to go to Trenton right away. Well, what would you do, Joe? Come home over Sundays? Sure, it's only 38 miles from here. Is that all the further Trenton is from Philadelphia? That's all. I always seem very far away to me. <laughs> I guess it's the name. I'm going to have to get fixed up a bit before I go over to that office. Well, listen, Joe. What? Don't say anything to him about this, or he'll be wanting to go up and talk to them newspaper people, too. You know, Mom, I kind of feel that there's something coming to that nut out of this thing. What do you mean? He gave me an idea here one night. Whoa, well, don't tell him that, for God's sakes, Joe, or as sure as you live, he'll be telling everyone that he did the whole thing. You remember that night he was saying here about being at work on a solution for the prevention of rust and iron and steel? Yes. Well, I had been telling him something about it a week or two before. Yeah, you were telling me. While he was waiting for Amy to come down. Yes. Well, he forgot the night he was telling me about it, that it had been me who was telling him about it. And he got it mixed. Well, that's the way he does with everything. But it was the way he got it mixed that gave me the idea. He said that it was a combination of chemical elements to be added to the metal in its molten state instead of applied externally, as they had been doing. Well, that's exactly what I'd been doing applying the solution externally in a mixture of paint. 
But the next day, I tried adding parts of it to the molten state of the metal, and it did the trick. Of course, he didn't know what he was saying when he said it. He never does. <laughs> and he didn't know anything about the solution formula, but it was the way he got what I'd been saying twisted that put the thing over. Well, that's no credit to him, Joe. I know. He was only blowing when he said it. Sure. Well, he don't know what a formula means, and I would have told him where he heard it, too, if I'd been you. I'd like to give him a little present of some kind out of this. What would you like to give him a present for? For making a mistake. Well, that's all everybody's doing around here. You want to give that fellow a present for making a mistake. That's what Frank Hyland said here today when I asked him why he paid his fine. He said, oh, you got to give a little present here and there once in a while. There's no use trying to be sensible. <laughs> well, I'd like to give him something. Well, I'll tell you what you can do, Joe, if you're so anxious about giving him something. Find out what Frank Hyland paid today and give him that. Don't give him any money, Joe. Don't give it to her either, for she'd only give it right over to him. Give it to me, and I'll give it to them when I think they need it. <laughs> Hello. Oh, you're home somewhere else tonight, Joe. The long threatening has come at last. What? The big news. The steel thing? Did they buy it, Joe? They bought it this afternoon. The, the check's in the safe down in the lawyer's office. Joe, you're not telling me the truth. Something about the invention, Joe. Hello, Aubrey. Did they know? So he says. They bought it this afternoon. Isn't that wonderful? Congratulations. Thanks. So we put it over to the tune of 100,000 clackers. No kidding. <laughs> Checks in the safe down in Farley's office. Well, you know what I always told you, kid. Leave it to you to call the turn, Aubrey. <laughs> well, Joe, tell us something about the invention. I've got to get dressed, Claire. I'll tell you about it later. He's got to go and talk to them people that bought the thing from him. Why, what will Joe do with all that money, Mom? Well, heaven knows. I don't. Have you any idea how much a hundred thousand dollars is? It's a fortune. Well, he's brought it on himself. He'll have to tend to it. <laughs> I'm sure I won't. If he's a wise bird, he'll let me handle that money for him. I could give him a couple of very fly tips on that. He don't want your tips, nor your taps, neither. We've already seen what one of your tips did to a fellow, and his arm has been in a sling ever since. <laughs> That's all right, Mother Fisher. But if he's a wise bimbo, he'll take the drooping left. And I'll double that money for him in the next two weeks. And give him an extra pair of trousers. I guess he'll need an extra pair of trousers if he's sitting around waiting for you to double his money. Prospective investors, they hear a man's got a few dollars laying around idle and they get in touch with him. Well, nobody's heard that you have any dollars laying around idle at the eight. Oh, I don't know. They may have. Listen, boy, if you got any dollars laying around idle, it'd be fair for you to be paying Frank Hyland the money he paid to keep you out of jail than to be looking around for an investment. Ma, is it true what Joe says about the invention? Well, here it is in the paper. This is that wonderful Aubrey. I thought our Joe said it wasn't in here. What is it? What's it say, Mom? Mad motorist find $1,000 for reckless driving. Mr. Aubrey Kuyper of 903 Lehigh Avenue was arranged today before Magistrate Lister of the 22nd Huntington Park Avenue Police Station to be brought up on the charges of having disregarded traffic signals at Broad Street and Erie Avenue last Monday evening, resulting in rather serious injuries to Mr. Joseph Hart, a traffic officer. The defendant was fined $1,000 for recklessness, disregard of traffic <coughs> signals, and driving an automobile without a license. That's the law for you. <laughs> what do you think of that, Clara? It's 
all over now, Mom. <laughs> Frank paid it. Well, why did Frank pay it? Well, it was either that or go to jail for six months. And you wouldn't want that on account of Amy. Well, Frank didn't have to pay it. Amy's got a mother. And you take that thousand dollar insurance check that I gave you and give it to Frank Hyland as sure as ever you see him. I don't want Frank Hyland losing any thousand dollar bills on account of this clown. It's bad enough that I would have to do it. Amy, what? Come in here a minute. What? Here's that skirt I was telling you about. Was that insurance man here today? What do you want to know for? Nothing. I was just wondering if he made it around this way today. Did he leave a paper here for me? Well, he wanted to. But I told him not to waste his time talking to you about a $50,000 insurance policy. A man would certainly have a swell chance trying to make something of himself around this hut. Listen, boy. Anytime you don't like this hut, you go straight to Lehigh Avenue to your two bedrooms above the Dago Barber Shop, and I'll be happy to see your heels. Stop talking, Mom. Nobody around here is trying to stop you from making anything of yourself. No, and nobody's trying to help me any either. Only trying to make me look like a, a pinhead every chance they get. Well, nobody'd have to try very hard to make you look like a pinhead. Your own silly talk will do that for you any time at all. Well, I suppose it's silly talk to try to make a good impression. Well, it's silly to try and make any impression of any kind, for the only one will be made will be the right one, and that will make itself. Well, if you were out in the world as much as I am, you'd very soon learn how much easier it is for a fellow to get along if people think he's got something. Well, it wouldn't take anybody very long to realize you haven't got very much. Is that so? You heard me. People that are smart enough to be able to make it easier oh, for you. That'll do. John, come tell us something about the invention. Well, they telephoned for me this afternoon, so I got the file and we went over there. They had the contracts all drawn up and everything. <laughs> Did they really give you $100,000 for it? Checks in the safe down in the lawyer's office. Joe, what do you think we ought to do with that money? <laughs> It's a funny thing, Mom. When I first talked to the Myers and Stevens people, I was only to get $50,000 advance. And I went, when I went over there today, they had the contracts drawn up for $100,000. And they're getting away with murder at that. Oh, keep still, you. You don't know anything about this at all. I made them think I knew something about it. You made who think? The Myers and Stevens people. What are you talking about, Aubrey? Do you know? Certainly I know what I'm talking about. I went to see those people last Saturday afternoon, after you told me they'd spoken to you. Well, what did you do up there, Aubrey? Why, I told them that they'd have to double the advance if they wanted to do business with us. And what business was that of yours? Well, I'm Joe's guardian, ain't I? Well, who told you you were? Well, he's got to have somebody tend to his business for him. He's only a lad. Well, he don't need you tending to his business. He's been tending to his business long before he ever saw you. He never landed $100,000, though, before he saw me, did he? Well, what did you say to them, Aubrey? Why, I simply told them that your father was dead and that I was acting in capacity of business advisor to you, and that if this invention of yours was as important as you had led me to believe it was, they were simply taking advantage of your youth by offering you $50,000 for it, and that I refuse to allow you to negotiate further unless they double the advance, market it at their expense, and one half the net. Sign on the dotted line. <laughs> well, did they know who you were? I told them that I was head of the house here, and that I was connected with the Pennsylvania Railroad. Well, it's too bad they don't know what you really do down there in Chloe's Bluff. I beat them to it. I called theirs first. Well, I certainly have to give you credit, Aubrey. That's the way the contract reads. I told it to them, and I told it to your lawyer, too. I'll have to give you a little present of some kind. Of this time. He'll not give me any present, Joe. Give it to your mother. She'll need it more than I will. Have you got the financial page there, Amy? Is this it? Thank you. Oh, Aubrey, you're wonderful. A little bit of bluff can go a long way sometimes, Amy. Isn't he wonderful, Mom? <sighs> God help me from now on. 
Abend 